Chapel, Malibu family and friends and first time visitors, we welcome you here today. We've got a great message for you. We've got great worship. I am reminded that in the Old Testament there is a very prominent spice and it was called myrrh. And what myrrh was used for is, well, first the process of myrrh, they would boil this down to a, through a steam and they would steam it into a tea-like fashion and they would drink it. And it, was, it had a lot of healing properties, but it was always recognized as the herb or spice of humility because of the way that it was steamed and brought down to be reduced to a minimum in order to benefit through its healing properties. This same spice was offered to Jesus at his birth by one of the wise men. It was also offered to Jesus on the cross. It symbolized humility. That when Jesus came into the world, that he would exercise humility, that the way up is down, that if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. Not that we lift ourselves up, but the Spirit of the Most High God lifts us up. As we are, as we are moving towards the end of Jesus' life, we're going to see today how Jesus begins to ask the people, who do the people say that I am? And we have a confession from one of the disciples. But within that confession, one of the disciples wasn't quite sure what the cross of Christ would actually mean. That what it would it mean to actually be a disciple. We're going to look at today what it means that, that we must reduce ourselves so that God can pour in his maximum. So stay tuned. We have another song of worship. We're real excited you're here. And God bless. Wednesday we talked about the tabernacle. It was an amazing lesson because it reminded me of all these different stages that God and his people went through. There's a moment where we couldn't be in this relationship that we are now with God because only the main person would go to the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus came, he built the new temple. And he tore the veil. And he allowed us to have that living relationship with God. So we ask him today. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of every praise we could ever bring. Worthy. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
build us up like the servants that we were called to be, Lord. And I will build my life upon your hand. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you. Good morning, everybody. I have a few words before Pastor Brian comes up to share the word with us. Uh, I'd first like to lead us in a prayer for all of our first responders, law enforcement, and veterans. This is our Independence Day Sunday. Um, Fourth of July was yesterday. So would you join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for everybody that makes a personal sacrifice to really live out the gospel, Lord. In John 15, 13, you say, Greater love hath no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And so we have a variety of people in this nation, Lord, that make that personal sacrifice, that put their line, their life on the line for the other. And so I just pray a blessing upon them, and I pray that for that personal sacrifice that you would reward them um, greatly in the spiritual realm. So that's in your precious name I pray. Amen. I also have a quick message uh, to give for our tithes and offerings. Um, the verse this week comes out of Second Chronicles chapter 31, 4 through 5. A little background on these verses. Second Chronicles is the story of the nation of Israel and eventually the two nations, Israel and Judah. And you have this pattern of kings that come up and there's a lot of hope. And then they basically don't follow God's law and they fall into patterns of unrighteousness. Proverbs 31 breaks this narrative. It is the story of a king that God helped to become righteous. Um, and the passage is uh, entitled The Reforms of Hezekiah. One of the most important things Hezekiah did was restoring the priesthood to his nation. Because by the time Hezekiah was king, the nation had almost forgotten God entirely. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verses 4, beginning in verse 4, it says, Moreover, Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests and the Levites, and that was the priestly class, that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. And so there's this story about God's people being restored, and God restoring us. And as part of that, uh, as a part of the commandment of the law, we have our tithes, our first fruits, our best efforts, the blessing that's, blessings that the Lord gives us. And so um, I pray you take some time to consider that in your heart and uh, pray with me now. Um, and then we'll hear from Pastor Brian. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. We trust you with this ministry. We pray that you would fill us up so that we can go out and tell other people about you. And that through obedience and consistency and discipleship, you would make us into men and women that bear your name well. So we've got three ways that you can give and partner with us. Um, you can go online to ccmalibu.com uh, forward slash donate. Text give to 84321. Or you can make checks payable to Calvary Chapel Malibu. All right, I've talked too much. Let's bring on Pastor Brian. 
Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. And a happy 4th of July weekend to everybody. Hope you had a great time yesterday. Just a, a little bit of trivia. I'm not giving a 4th of July message today, but I, I cannot go without saying something because it is one of my favorite. If my top, my top four favorite holidays, I just love the 4th of July. I think I love that it's in summertime and it's always associated with water and food, etc. Just a bit of trivia for you. Did you know that when the founding fathers and they founded this country and they started to architect this country and the, the you know the constitution etc that there was a much discussion about what would be the the bird of this country and so as we know today that the bird is the the bald eagle but there was one person by the name of Benjamin Franklin I believe you all know who he was uh, his interest he thought that the country would better be served if uh, the bird was actually a very hardy bird and so his choice was the turkey he wanted a turkey to be the national bird and so obviously by the grace of God he, he we did not get the turkey as the national bird but in ode to Benjamin Franklin yesterday I ate two very large turkey burgers yeah, that's right ground turkey so uh, just a little bit of trivia for you I can hear you laughing out there I'm laughing as well so I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, we got a great message as we walk through the gospel according to Mark. And we today are in Mark chapter 8, verses 27, and we're going to go through chapter 9, verse 1. Just the first verse of chapter 9. So if you get, go ahead and open up your Bibles, we'll jump right into the scriptures and we'll get to the message. Mark 8, verse 27 through chapter 9, verse 1. Let us read. Now when Jesus and his disciples went out of the town of Caesar went out to the town of Caesarea Philippi and on the road he asked his disciples saying to them whom do men say that I am and so they answered John the Baptist but some say Elijah and others one of the prophets he said to them but who do you say that I am and Peter answered and said to him you are the Christ and then he strictly warned them that they shall tell no one about him and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly, and then Peter took him aside and re re began to rebuke him. Could you imagine this? And so, when, but when he turned, he turned around, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but rather the things of men. And when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then verse 1 of chapter 9. And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you open our heart to your word and your word to our heart illuminate our spirits and help us lord to be absolutely ready and willing to receive what you have for us this day in the name of the father the son the holy spirit and in jesus name we pray amen such an incredible passage when i was a young man i think i was about 22 years of age i started to read the new testament and i had this little orange gideon's bible that i used to carry around with me in my back pocket everywhere i'd go and I was just reading and I always loved the words and read what Jesus would say. And I remember one very distinct night, and I think it was like in January or February, because it was a cold winter night, and I was outside of a I was actually outside of a park and I was under a street lamp and I was reading the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, 25, that says, For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. And I thought to myself, what in the world does that mean? It made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Those are the same words in this passage that Jesus is telling us about the cross and what it means to lose one's life into God, but in so doing, surrendering our life, our ambitions, dreams, etc., to God, 
He will replace it with so much more than we could possibly ever imagine. You see, the way up is down, and when we come to Jesus, it's going to cost us something. But what we buy when we buy the, the pearl of great price far exceeds anything that we could ever conjure up in our own gifts, talents, and abilities. You see, what does it cost you to confess Jesus Christ as Lord? And I'm going to say it very tersely. Everything. But what you get on the other side will far outweigh anything you may possess prior to coming to the Lord. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But we see Jesus, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, and now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Look at that. We see Jesus. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Jesus. In order to have a vision of Jesus in our heart, there's a place that we ourselves need to die to ourselves so that Christ can live alive in our hearts. And so I'm going to break this passage down into three sections. Uh, the first section is confessing Jesus is Christ. Uh, secondly, confessing Christ's suffering. And thirdly, confessing the cross that we carry. Confessing the cross that we carry. So verse, verses, first, verses 27 through 30, confessing Jesus is Christ. So this takes place in a place called Caesarea Philippi. I've been there actually uh, when I met my wife. We were on a trip to Israel together. And I remember dialoguing with my wife. I actually still remember what she was wearing. I know that all of you don't care that. But I remember specifically what she was wearing at Caesarea Philippi. Okay, I know you're dying to know, ladies, what she was wearing. She was wearing a pair of white slacks with a, uh, a mauve-colored top that blended into the bougainvillea in the background in Israel. I still remember that exactly, but I digress. Caesarea Philippi, during Jesus' time, was known for its pagan idolatry. It, was, it had a very rich religious history to it. It was the center for Baal worship, and also there's still a very large cave that you can see today that was considered the birthplace of the god of nature, whose name was Pan or Panias. And so Herod the Great, so this was a beloved place for Herod the Great. And so Herod the Great built 14 different marble temples in this region called Caesarea Philippi. But then it was his son Philip who took it to the next level and, and, and just took a place of magnificence with the temples. And, then it, and this temple was known worldwide. People would travel from all over the place to see the temples that, that um, Herod the Great's son Philip had basically built into these fortresses, hence he would call it Caesarea Philippi. And so we see that he named it both after Caesar, and he also got his own name in there as Caesarea Philippi. And this was the backdrop to which Jesus was speaking. It was known worldwide to come and worship the God of your choice. Any God that you wanted to worship, you could find in Caesarea Philippi, except for the one true God, the Lord our God, Yahweh, the Lord our God who would send his only son to die upon a cross for all that would believe in him. So you could either have the buffet of gods or you could die to yourself, die to all the prosperity gods, and come and follow the one true God that will give you eternal life. It's against this religious backdrop that Christ asked them, Whom do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am? When you look at all of these other gods, this God can promise you power. This God can promise you prosperity. This God can promise you long life. All these different, this God can, can promise you um, a, a romantic relationship such as Aphrodite. All these different gods can promise you something. But then Christ says, but who do the people say that I am? And they say, well, some people say that you are John the Baptist incarnate, that he's resurrected in you, and now you're John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a very upright individual. He's a very bold, strong character. There's, and, and you kind of have those same representations. And he was also willing to martyr himself. And it seems like you, Lord, are willing to martyr yourself as well. So some people say you're John the Baptist. Others? Others say you're like Elijah, you're a great prophet, you're a great teacher, and you have miracles associated with you. You're, you. Some say that you're Elijah the prophet. Others say you're of one of the Old Testament prophets, and they're not really sure. And Jesus pauses for a moment, and then he says to them, he says, but who do you say that I am? 
Now, when he asked this question, who do you say that I am? It was in a very, um, uh, 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 it was in a very, uh, how would I say it? It was in a very deliberate manner. The word in the Greek is actually eperotao, eperotao. And it means that he kept on saying it. So when he asked them that question, it didn't just come out, you are the Christ. He asked them and there was a pause. And then he must have asked them again. And as they looked at all the other gods around them, and as they must have contemplated what it would mean to confess that Jesus is the Christ, that you are the Messiah, you are the one that the Old Testament has been writing about and we have learned about since we were little kids in primary school, you are the one, there was a pause. You see, Peter answers this critical question that would determine one's destiny. Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the promised one. The answer was terse. It was immediate. It was confession that both saved souls, but also would be what the church would be built upon. In Matthew 16, we know that the Lord responds to Peter's response of saying, You are the Christ, by simply saying, He says, Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And upon this confession, the very church of God will be built upon. Pretty incredible. Look what the, uh, the Apostle Paul would say in Romans 10. He says that if, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe that you are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess that you are saved. You see, so this was it. Peter confessed it. He was right up front, ready to confess it. You are the Christ, and the Father from heaven had revealed it to him. In other words, there was divine favor happening upon Peter. We would call this the apocalypsis, the awakening of the heart, or the quickening, the anointing for him to see who Christ really was. And at this point, Jesus strictly warns them to not tell anyone because Jesus is going to begin to teach them even more ideas of what the Christ will go through. Look at verses 31 through 33 as we move into our second main point, confessing Christ's suffering. You see in verse 31, we see the way of the spiritual Christ, the way of discipleship. It says in verse 31 that he began to teach them that the Son of Man, the son of man must suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and that he will actually be killed. He, so this is a very important transition that Christ has confessed and now Jesus begins to tell them what he's about to go through, that he must suffer these things and that Jesus actually will predict his resurrection, that after three days he will rise again. Look at John 12, 24. It says in John 12, 24, right there, it says, most assuredly, this means truly, truly, that means listen to what I'm about to say to you. I say to you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. It produces much grain. You see, this idea of dying to be made alive is that Christ is saying, unless I do die, unless I do suffer, unless I do go to the cross and bear the sins of the world, you cannot live. That only by me dying and going into my burial, that the Spirit of God will raise me from the dead, and that same Spirit will go into you as you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You see, Jesus would later in the same chapter of John, in verse 32 to be exact, he would say, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, this is an idea that to be lifted up from the earth was to be put and placed upon his cross. That if he were lifted up from the earth, he will draw all peoples to myself. What that means is that all nations, creeds, tribes, tongues, colors, etc. All people from different tribes, different nations, different backgrounds, different societal backgrounds, all of them will come and they will come to see who Christ really is, was, and is to come. It's an incredible moment, but it doesn't stop there. You see, there is the way of the spiritual Christ, but then there is the way of the natural man. Look at verse 32. He spoke these words openly, and then Peter takes him aside, because he doesn't want to embarrass Christ in, rest of the, in front of the rest of the disciples. He pulls him to the side, and he begins to rebuke him. You see, the natural man rejects suffering. 
The natural man cannot see that the way up is down. The natural man does not embrace humility or meekness. The natural man is all about putting oneself into a position of, of power, advertising oneself. We call it self-promotion. And this is the exact opposite of what Christ is teaching us. He said, you must, as, as John the Baptist encountered Jesus for the first time, he looked at him and he knew that he was Lord. And he said, you must increase, but I must, that's emphatic, I must decrease. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and the Lord our God will lift you up. You see, the natural man rebels against the idea of the cross. And Peter could not accept the idea that the Son of God, the living God, would actually be the suffering servant. That he was trying to deter him. It says that he rebukes Jesus. And this word is epitomao. And this word epitomao means it's a strong, forceful attempt. It's a correction. So he's actually correcting Christ, saying, no, I'm sorry, you got this wrong. God's got much greater plans for you than going to some cross like a criminal. Look at the people that are following you. They will make of you a great king. You're the Messiah. You're the one that we've always been waiting for. You're the one that's going to get the boot of Rome off of Israel's neck. He rebukes him. He takes him to the side, urging Jesus to be the Messiah of power and of fame and of fortune. You see, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, according to the Apostle Paul. So the natural man, in essence, are you ready for this, is of Satan. Look at this. Right here, Jesus turns it on Peter, and, he, and Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Could you imagine this? You were the one that just confessed who was Christ. It wasn't one of the other disciples. You just said, You are the Christ. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, My Father in heaven has revealed this unto you. That's an incredible moment for all of us disciples. And the very next beat, he's being called Satan. How have you ever been called Satan by Jesus? He's saying right here that the natural man is of the spirit of Satan, which is the spirit of self-promotion and pride. He's saying you are of the spirit of Satan, literally meaning Satan means adversary. You are an adversary to the way God thinks. Do you know that the mind of Christ, according to the book of Philippians chapter 2, says this is the mind of Christ in you that you would put others' needs as more important than your own. That's what it says. It's always about the other person. We have what we need in Christ. And how often we can be like, well, Lord, I need this and I need that. But we will get all of our needs met in the riches of Christ. The true spirit of God, the true spirit of Christ is giving out what has been entrusted to us to a lost and dying world. And we do so by lifting their needs as more important than our own. Peter was an adversary to Jesus at this very moment. G Peter was an adversary to Jesus going to the cross and he did it with the best intentions. How often our best intentions can be the enemy of God's very best. We need to keep these things in check. What really is of the Lord and what is really in our own sentiment. You see, natural men set their mind on material things, material gain, and material position, power, and prestige. It's what we focus on. He says, the Lord says of Peter, that you're not mindful of the things of God, but of men. He's saying, you're thinking more like a natural man. You see, Jesus was being tempted by one of those closest to him in his inner circle. I happen to have really wonderful parents, and I know many people that have really wonderful parents. But how sometimes wonderful parents, because they can be emotionally attached to their children, they think they have their children's best interest in mind, but sometimes it can be the enemy of God's best. Sometimes God wants... Let me pause here for a second, though. God has also instructed us as children to respect and honor our parents and to give them reverence, and you will live long upon the earth. 
but sometimes parents can be a little emotionally attached uh, and don't always see the bigger picture of what God is doing in a person's life. And, and sometimes, you know, I've, I've had many encounters where I've seen young men or women wanting to go off to seminary or wanting to go off to Bible school or non-accredited Bible schools or whatever, and the Lord's calling them into it. And their parents were irate. They'd say, Pastor, talk to my son. Tell him what it's like to be in the ministry. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I think you're talking to the wrong person. Uh, but it's amazing how most parents don't really want their children to go into the ministry because there's not a lot of financial security in the ministry. There's not a lot of power, prestige, or position in the ministry. And so they deter them away. Others really push their children into the ministry, etc. But nevertheless, sometimes a parent's good intention can be the enemy of God's very best intention God, that, uh, God has for your life. Right here, Peter's good intention was the enemy of God's best. He was actually being, he was serving as a natural man and an adversary to the cross of Christ. Look what it says in 1 Peter 3.18. This is after Peter has been now discipled, been walking with Christ for years. Jesus has long been dead, raised, and the Spirit of God is now in Peter. And Peter gave the greatest speech one's ever really given at Pentecost, apart from Christ's speeches and a lot of Paul's, etc. But he says these words in 1 Peter 3.18. He says, For Christ died for sins once for all. The righteous for the unrighteous. Do you think he's thinking of himself? He was righteous and he died for me who was unrighteous to bring you to God. And he's probably thinking in that very moment to bring me to God. When I couldn't see it, he could see past my good intentions. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive by the Spirit. And that I might add that just as Christ was made alive by the Spirit, because he promised, he said, I cannot send the Spirit to you unless I go away. But if I go away, meaning if I go to heaven, I will send the same Spirit that raises me from the dead. I will send it to you. And he, Peter, as he writes this, I can only imagine that he was also thinking that just as Christ was made alive by that Spirit, that Holy Spirit, that sanctified Spirit, so I was made alive just as well. And as he wrote this, he's saying that you too can be made alive by the same Spirit. In 1 Peter 4, he continues this idea. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. He's saying that the Spirit of God will bring you to a place where you won't even want to be in the things of the world anymore. And when we see sin, he's not just talking about some sort of carnality as as sort of the people in the church like to tease me when I talk about swinging from the chandeliers. But he's talking about a greater picture of sin, which is to walk as a natural, unredeemed man or woman. To prioritize the things of this world before the things of God. You see, we are in essence spiritual people having a natural experience. It's not the other way around as a Christian. We're not, uh, the, the non Christian is a natural person having random spiritual experiences. But for those of us that have been born again, that we have lost our lives so that it's been saved for all eternity, we are spiritual beings with a citizenship in heaven having random natural experiences this side of heaven. And this moves us to our third and final point in uh, verse 34 through verse, chapter 9, verse 1, confessing the cross that we carry. You see, the issue is first and foremost of discipleship. In verse 1, or actually, I'm sorry, in verse 34, he says, When Jesus called the people to himself with his disciples, he said to them, Who do ever desires to come after me? He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, there is a lot of different ideas about what the cross is, but I'm going to give you my definition of what the cross is that you carry. The cross that you carry is, the cro is what the cross represents. And what does the cross represent? The cross clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, it doesn't represent your financial situation. It doesn't re represent your living situations. It doesn't represent your vocational situations. Those are not the cross that you bear. 
The cross that you bear is the reconciliation of human beings to a holy God. That's what the cross is. And when he says to pick up your cross and follow me, he's essentially saying the cross that you carry, pick up those people in your life and carry them to the cross. Present them to God. Bear their burdens until they know how to cast their burdens upon the Lord. And then they'll understand that it's God who sustains them. In other words, let me say this very simply. The cross that you carry are the souls of humanity human beings those that are most trying in your life those that are easier your neighbors your friends the person at the grocery store your boss your co-workers those people that are under you your employees whatever it is the cross that you carry are the souls of humanity those are the cross that you carry and god has given you an opportunity to minister to those gods entrusted to you I'm reminded that when Jesus was marching his way to his cross, he was carrying his cross, but he was marching to Calvary. He himself couldn't even carry it. He had to have somebody else carry it for him. There was a man that came along, the Ethiopian, that carried the cross for Jesus because it was too big to bear. And so we, others, we can't bear our own crosses, but we help others bear their cross until they can get to a place where they understand who Jesus always is and was and is to come. We also see that there is the issue of eternal life. In verse 35, Jesus says those infamous words that I started this message with, that whoever desires to save his life, he will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, the very same shall save it. In other words, holding on to all the things that you have in this life may very well cost you eternal life. When we put more power and more focus on the things that we have this side of heaven rather than the things in heaven, then those things cloud our vision of being able to see the Most High God. You've heard it said many a times that there's no, there's no U-Haul trailer traveling behind you to the cemetery. You can't take it with you. The only thing you can take with you is a redeemed soul for all eternity. This was the verse that really I pondered for seven years until I gave my life to Christ. And it was after that seventh year that I prayed to receive the sinner's prayer. And at that point, I had a great job. I had a career that was developing. I was living in downtown Chicago on a big high rise. And then the Lord started to remove the things that were made of wood, hay, and stubble. And he wanted to build my life on a rock that was Christ. And he began to pull those things away. And I said, Lord, you've, and I freely gave them to the Lord. I it was like pulling teeth on a few of those things. But nevertheless, the point is, is that God gave me a life that I could never imagine today. I've, drive, I've traveled around the globe, literally, to several different continents, sharing the gospel in the deepest parts of culture. It has been an incredible experience. I would never give up what the Lord has given me through simply giving my life to Christ. I could have never imagined that I'd be pastoring a church, that this would be an impossible thought to think that I myself would actually be pastoring a group of people. And we've seen so many people come and go through our ministry, in a sense, especially college students, since we pastor near Pepperdine uh, University. And it's just been tremendous to have the opportunity to pour into these young lives as, as they're preparing their lives before them. We've even married a few, which has been a real joy. We also see in verse 38 that he says that for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man shall also be ashamed. And this is an issue of image. Um, one of my favorite things of being a pastor is that when you're meeting new people and your conversation's kind of going down, they say, so what do you do for a living? I love saying that I'm a pastor, not because I have pride in my position, but I love where the conversation goes. It either unfolds or like, oh, okay. And they kind of deter and start to want to get away from you. Or they want to engage more. They well, what is that like? And what do you do? And what do you believe? And why do you believe what you believe? And what do you think about all the other different religions of the world, etc., etc.? I always love it. And the illustration I give when you get to all the different religions of the world, I love the clear and very the very clear and concise difference between Christianity and all the other religions of the world. You see, all the other religions of the world, you name it, every single one of them share a similar philosophy. And that philosophy is that we are evolving, we are working, we are reincarnating, whatever you want to call it, we are, in, in, we are evolving to a place where we are climbing up to God. 
we see the very first place that this happened was in the Tower of Babel, chapter 11 of Genesis. They were working their way to God. And God knew that you would never be able to work your way to God to such a perfection that would be demanded upon your soul for all eternity. And so he, knowing that you could never make it to God by working your way to God, knew that he would have to send his son to work his way to you. All the religions of the world are about man, humanity, working their way to God, whereas Christianity is the one religion where God worked his way to man through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus would say, and this is the work of God, that you would believe in him whom God has sent. And who is he? The Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, we see that Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. Jesus is essentially saying that as much as I preach, as much as the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the bystanders, they saw who I was, they saw what I did, they even saw the power of the resurrection, there are some of them will, that will still not taste of death, meaning they will still not give their life over to me until they see the presence of God in the second coming with absolute power. And yes, they may get saved at that last moment, but how many others did they give their life for to stepping stones to get to Christ? We started with Hebrews 2.9, and we closed with Hebrews 2.9 today. But we see Jesus, who was made just a little lower than the angels, but now, as we speak, he's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, because he went to the cross, because he gave his life for you and I, so that, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone, so that everyone that puts their trust in him can live by him. I want to ask you today, that if you've never put your trust, if you've never put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, I'm going to say these two words, why not? Is it that you don't like Jesus? Is it that you do not believe in Jesus? If you tuned in today and you've never given your life to Christ, I promise you, I know deep in my heart that when God calls somebody to turn on that computer and to watch a video or to show up to a church service, God is working on that person's soul to hear the gospel because the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. And you may be hearing his voice today. And you may have been hearing his voice for weeks or months or as it was with the case of me, it took years. But I tell you, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow for you do not know what tomorrow holds. No man, woman, or child can foresee tomorrow. But the Lord knows what tomorrow holds. And we know that today is the day of salvation. If your heart is being pricked again, it's being warmed, you know in your innermost being that these words speak to my soul as they did for me and many others that are surrounding me. I say today we're going to pray the sinner's prayer. We're going to ask Jesus into our life. As we, ask, as we ask Jesus into our life and as we pray the sinner prayer, I'm going to also speak to all of you out there that have perhaps fallen away from the Lord. We call it backsliding, meaning you've moved away from Christ. Or maybe, you're, maybe you haven't fallen away, but your heart has grown cold to the Lord. Well, the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And when we grow cold in the Lord, more often than not, we may have had a really wonderful salvation experience, just a real great apocalypse, a revelation of who Christ is. But sometimes what we do is we start to take back our life and our heart gets cold towards the things of God. We start to act like natural men again. And so if you're that person or some of those categories in between, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer again with me today. And we're going to ask for a renewal in your heart. And so with that, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, and bow your head and open your heart and repeat these words after me. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your death. We thank you for the work you're doing now in drawing me to the cross. Lord, we acknowledge you as our Lord and as our Savior. Jesus, 
come into my heart, take over my soul, and cause me to live for you. Refresh me, Lord, in your spirit, and cause me to follow you all the days of my life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want to ask you that if you are near us in Calvary Chapel, Maui, you live in this area, when we get back going, I insist that you come and you show us who you are and meet me. I want to meet you. I want to pray with you. I want to spend time with you. If you prayed that prayer today, would you just, and you're on Facebook, would you go ahead and just email us at prayer at ccmalibu.com or you just email us at prayer at ccmalibu.com or if you're on Facebook, just put a comment on the Facebook page right there and, and let us know what's going on. You can let us know your name so we can pray for you, etc. If you are, say, outside of Malibu or outside of Los Angeles and you maybe you're in, uh, who knows, Iowa or so wherever you may be, I want to encourage you to find a Bible-believing church. If you need help finding one, Call us or, or contact us at info at ccmalibu.com and I will personally call you and, and we'll find a church together. Um, I know many people across the country and we will find a place for you. Uh, so I want to encourage you that it also that if you just gave your life to Christ today, read the Bible morning and evening. First things first, read Psalm 1 and it will show you that if you read the word of the Lord morning and evening, there's a direct promise attached to it that you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth fruit in season and out of season. I want to thank you for tuning in. We got some worship for you and, and we're going to go ahead and have a song of worship and I'll be back to close the service.
want to thank you for tuning in today. We're very grateful for our online audience. We're also grateful for those that are partnering with us uh, through prayer, through finances, through everything that we're getting to end. We are definitely a family. We are looking forward to getting back to meeting face to face. Um, so keep that attuned. We will probably be back here in the next couple weeks. But until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious upon you and smile upon you and give you the peace of God which surpasses all understanding in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.